Well, hello and welcome. Um, I'm Nicole Clements and I'll be facilitating our session with results today. Hashtag raise your hand for global education. Welcome. We're really excited to have you here as part of this amazing online event. Today yeah. we delve into this subject in depth to have an inspiring conversation and to challenge you to encourage others to take action by influencing our community leaders about this important issue. I'd first like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today. I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation from where I'm based and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this online event today. Just to quickly introduce myself, I'm sorry about the glare of my glasses, um, but I, I am really excited to be here. I'm Nicole Clements. Um, I'm a former television journalist working for ABC, SBS and internationally for Associated Press, NBC and many others. I've spent almost 10 years working in international aid and development. And like many of you, I have a huge passion um, for global education and the ability for it to transform lives. As you all know, today's event is led by Results. Results is a global community of passionate, empowered, everyday people who use their voice to help end global poverty. And together with this large network of advocates, we can inform policy decisions to build a better world where everyone can go to school, eat nutritious food and live free from deadly diseases. So let's delve into the why of global education. Firstly, we're faced with the biggest disruption to education in history due to a combination of young and growing populations, high poverty rates and deepening inequalities, socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19. Secondly, we'll hear about how global partnership for education is a success story of international cooperation on improving global education outcomes. And finally, we'll hear why Australia has a unique opportunity to contribute to improving global education outcomes and why we all have the power to do something really meaningful here. But we're not alone in calling on our leaders to invest in global education. Today, we welcome our friends from Oak Tree, UNICEF Australia, the University of Sydney and Teach for Australia, who will be speaking on our panel in a minute. And we thank the support of Global Citizen, Child Fund Australia, Save the Children Australia, Australian Himalayan Foundation, Australian Progress and University of New South Wales for joining us on this call to advocate together for global education. We also have federal parliamentarians joining us today, which we're very excited to have. We have uh, Mr. Graham Perrett, member for Morton, Lizzie from uh, Mr. Andrew Wilkie's office, member for Hobart. Um, Mr. Tony Zappia, member for Macon, and also we have Senator Deborah O'Neill, who we'll hear from later today. Finally, we have all of us who are part of diverse communities. Some of us are parents. Um, I'll put my hand up there and struggling with the challenges of lockdown and everything. Um, some of us are educators, some of us are students, anthropologists, activists from the uh, Sydney Seek community, work for Apple, and polyphony. Um, polyphony uh, choir members, but all of us share a common passion. Children and young people, wherever they may be from, have the skills and knowledge to unlock the future that they want. So now we're going to hear a video from Julia Gillard, who's the Chair of Global, Global Partnerships for Education and the former Prime Minister of Australia. She's also long been a supporter of results and will lend her voice to this issue in this video. If I can now ask Bruna to share her screen. And it just goes for a few minutes. Hello, advocates. I'm Julia Gillard, Chair of the Board of Directors of the Global Partnership for Education, GPE. I'm so pleased to be with you all today. GPE is a fund and a partnership that supports developing countries to transform their education systems. Evidence has shown the importance of getting basic education right if we are to achieve a more equal, peaceful and prosperous planet. We are so grateful for the work results and its advocates spearhead on behalf of GPE, 
From the US and Canada to the UK, Australia, Japan and beyond, we know how influential your advocacy is with decision makers. Thank you for helping make the case for why education is critical to recovering from the coronavirus pandemic. This pandemic has been the largest disruption to education in history, exacerbating an already critical education and gender equality crisis. Many out of school children are girls and many of them will never return to school or even start school, lowering their chances of future employment and decent livelihoods. Education budgets everywhere are under severe strain even before picking up school reopening costs. The global community must respond strongly and ensure global education is a top priority as we fight the pandemic in many countries and start reopening in others. At GPE, we are focused on the Global Education Summit in July, co-hosted by the UK and Kenyan governments. We seek at least $5 billion over five years from donors to enable millions of children to start school and millions more to receive a quality education. This investment will help ensure we don't backslide on progress made and also help get girls back on the path to gender equality. Let's continue to partner to ensure that education isn't a casualty of any future emergency, whether it's caused by health or conflict or climate change. Please accept our deepest appreciation for your support. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. Well, thank you very much. That was really inspiring. Um, I loved seeing the pictures of um, the children in the classrooms in that in that video and hearing the inspiring um, the, this inspiring message. So now um, let's join our panel of speakers who are really excited to have today. Um, and I'll quickly introduce them. So Yun Fun An is the Global Partnership for Education's Youth Leader and advisor to Plan International. She's also a teacher and a youth activist for gender equality and girls' rights from Vietnam. Ahn believes that a transformative education system is the key to, a, uh, to achieve an equitable and free world for all. So thank you for joining us today, Ahn. We're excited to have you. Next, we have Thanu Harath, the CEO of Oak Tree, Australia's largest youth-run international development agency. Oak Tree oversees youth empowerment and leadership projects across Asia Pacific. Thanu believes that young people are the key to unlocking the solution to the biggest issues we will face in the future. And I have to say, I agree. Priyanka Menon is a high school teacher and alumna of Teach for Australia. She is passionate about empowering students to engage and reform an inequitable education system. She's also passionate about addressing education inequality and amplifying student voices in education issues. So welcome. Dr. Alexandra McCormick is a senior lecturer at University of Sydney. She has undertaken extensive research in this field, particularly around education for all campaign in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. Dr. McCormick has taught in schools in Japan and China and has a strong knowledge about the impact of international development assistance on global education systems. So thank you very much for joining us. Emily Abbott is a youth ambassador for UNICEF Australia. During her time in this role, she's heard from hundreds of young people about their views on issues such as mental health, climate change and education. Emily is passionate about seeing positive outcomes for all young people, and she hopes to one day bring her advocacy and experience to a career at the United Nations or another international organisation. Fantastic, Emily. And finally, um, later we will hear from Senator Deborah O'Neill, who is Senator for New South Wales and Regional Representative for Oceania on International Parliamentary Network for Education. She'll speak later about her passion for global education and inspire us all to take action for a better tomorrow. So thank you very much for joining us. So now let's um, just give a context to this discussion. Presently, 50% of the world's students are currently out of school to, due to partial or full school closures linked to the pandemic. 
258 million children and adolescents are out of school worldwide, with girls and children with disabilities more likely to be out of school in most low to middle income countries. So that's the context with which we're talking about this today, which is an urgent and pressing one. So just if I could ask my first question to Emily. Emily, as Youth Ambassador for UNICEF Australia, you've heard from thousands of young people about various issues, including education. How has that inspired you to advocate for education? It's one of the great privileges that I undertook as a young ambassador. Uh, part of the program was running the consultations where we went out to schools, which totaled around 3,200 children, young people, at the end of the program. So a culmination of all that, it's hard not to be inspired by those young people. And it, as we went to a lot of schools, it ended up uh, becoming apparent that education was a front of mind issue for young people. So because of that, I found it immensely, I can't even describe the, the words for it. Um, there was so, I felt so much privilege to be able to un try to understand a small snippet of the lives of various young people around Australia. Um, speaking from my own experience, I remember speaking to a young girl in New South Wales. I'm based in Victoria, so in some ways it was quite, quite um, helpful to be able to speak on Zoom as I wouldn't have been able to reach some young people otherwise. So this young girl in New South Wales, she had her entire extended family still in Zimbabwe and she had not been able to contact them for nearly four months. At the same time, while she was dealing with all this, she was in year 11, going into her final year. She was homeschooling her younger brother in year one and her youngest uh, sister in prep. And she, all while helping out at home, doing everything, and while being able to recognise and articulate the importance of education, yeah, that's, it's, it's a, a huge responsibility, isn't it, to carry all those things and, and at the same time be trying to get ahead as a young person yourself and huge challenges. So that, that's a really insightful um, answer. Thank you, Emily. Um, as I was preparing for tonight, I, I was just thinking about the impact um, of education in my own life. And um, so with this question, I want to ask all panellists um, or whoever feels confident to, to talk to it, um, how, have your how have our lives and your lives been transformed by education? I'm happy to go first on this one. Um, yeah, my life has been, I think, like everybody else's, completely changed by the education that I have been very lucky to receive. So to give everyone some context on my own story, my family moved down to Australia in the 90s during the Sri Lankan Civil War. And during that time, education and any sort of tertiary education in particular was really hard to come by for anyone because of the lack of resources, violence and civil unrest that was plaguing the country at that time. Um, my mum was lucky to receive a scholarship from RMIT actually here in Melbourne and that was the start of my family's life here and they built themselves from that in a totally different culture and I was able to grow up as a result in a great school and had all the opportunities that I could have possibly hoped for. And I think I look at all the opportunities I've had and every single step of the puzzle that has got me to where I am today in my role here at Oak Tree. And I think a lot of that does come down to that, that opportunity that my mum got to come here and to access a good education. And unfortunately, a lot of my family members uh, in Sri Lanka still don't have that sort of um, privilege, if that's the right word. Uh, for example, my little baby cousin is still not back at school because uh, the education facilities there aren't um, up to scratch and aren't able to keep up with online learning. So I think for me, it's a very personal story of why education is important around the world. And that's what brings me to this discussion today. Yeah, it's really moving. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anyone else? Hi everyone. Um, thanks. Thanks also to to Results and GP for the opportunity to be here and 
just following on from you, Kenu, my, um, first of all, the, the opportunities that my parents um, gave me as well. My dad's from the north of England, Barnsley, a small mining town that also um, had its share of poverty, quite different, of course, to you know, um, the nature of poverty that we, we're focusing on tonight. But um, he, he didn't finish high school, then carried on his education through um, a correspondence course, became an accountant, but really focused on education for us. Met my mum in Kenya. She's uh, from Mauritius, Seychelles, Reunion Islands. So um, they they then travelled to different places in order to be able to um, better their situation, and they, they had the, the privilege and opportunities to do that. And I think they always um, impressed upon us that the importance um, of that as well. And then from that that education, I. Um, went to teach in Japan as my first teaching job and, and traveled around um, Southeast Asia before any of the research that I'd done and really um, was able to fill some of those gaps from, from my schooling. And it, so for me, education of all different types, um, learning from my students in Japan, learning about um, you know, now, you know, decades into this job, um, every unit I teach, every class I go into that, privilege and that multiplier effect that teachers, we have teachers here on the panel and in the audience too, um, the, the possibilities, the, the inspiration that educators um, can hopefully um, pass on and, and the power that we have to um, change lives has, has been something that continually motivates me and I, I, I know will into the future. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Go ahead. Um, well, I know for me, um, I went to boarding school. So I um, previously was in Solomon Islands with my family and I was there for six months um, and I left because the education actually wasn't sufficient. Um, so I mean, pretty obvious reason why I'm here today. Um, but I had to leave behind some of my friends who were from Solomon Islands um you know native to Solomon's and they didn't have the opportunities that I had um and they had to stay back um and go on to there was only one university on our island um and it was it was really dangerous um and they ended up building fences around their boarding house um and it there was only um a handful of scholarships there and it was ridiculously expensive um and just a really dangerous place to be in so for me um definitely when I go back I see that you know there there isn't enough um, opportunities and the schooling system isn't very good there. So, fantastic! Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Okay, well we'll move on to the next question. So, Ann, um, I wanted to ask why are you passionate about global education? I strongly believe education is a fundamental human right and everyone all about the world should have access to education. And I know for sure that education is the key for a level playing field for all because uh, it gives people a way out of poverty and keep a person empowered with knowledge and understanding can change their life in the world for the better. So about um, a year ago, when I was working with uh, Plan International Vietnam, I met a fellow youth advocate that inspired me to advocate for education. She's uh, from mountainous area of Vietnam in a survivor of early marriage. Uh, she's married her husband, who is the same age as 17, in the belief that um, he could spare her parents a financial burden. So. Uh, later, she was told by her in-laws to drop school and give up on her dream, which is singing. So now the three years old couple have two kids are going to have three and are not financially independent and have um, to rely on the husband parents. It's definitely not easy for them to support their family. So she regrets every day about her decision of dropping school at the age of 17, giving up on her life dreams and getting into marriage too early. So, however, I really admire her, her perseverance because despite all, diffi uh, all difficulties, she's an advocate for gender equality now and fighting against early marriages. She always says to me that um, I will make sure my daughters can go to school and make decisions about her body, 
her appearance and her life. So her life story really inspired me to advocate for girls' education. So that's why as a GP youth leader, I'm raising awareness of uh, barriers to education and advocate for increasing finance for education. Mm, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Uh, I mean, I can see why you feel so passionately about it. Um, Priyanka, can I ask you, you're a teacher and an advocate for young people having voices in the community, in communities. Um, why do you think it's important for the government to hear from young people? Um, so I think there's three uh, main reasons that I think that is really important to sort of hear from young people. Um, firstly, I think that young people are really critical thinkers, especially young people from marginalized groups. So I'm a teacher um, in a school where many students have um, uh, come from refugee backgrounds or um, uh, are young migrants in Australia. And I think that, you know, they because they've had that sort of outsider perspective, and I think that gives them the ability to sort of think critically and differently to what may be the mainstream might sort of experience. And so I think that sort of gives them a, a fresh perspective. And I think it's really important to listen to that because it might give us an idea of something that we haven't really thought of before. Uh, secondly, I think that listening to young people also just really increases their engagement. Um, it allows them to have a say in their own experiences. And I think that it means that their learning becomes then purposeful to them um, instead of sort of uh, you know, motivating them through sort of extrinsic ways, I think that an intrinsic motivation is really important and listening to them and understanding their motivations uh, sort of, you know, helps to kickstart that intrinsic drive in them to learn. Um, and thirdly, I think that, you know, I think for me as a, as a teacher, I really want my students to be engaged and civic minded. And I think that um, it's really important to uh, hear from them so that they see the um, benefits there are to being engaged as well. I think sometimes, you know, if they haven't really been engaged and then it suddenly they turn 18, they're allowed to vote, they're allowed to have a say in things, but they haven't actually developed those skills to be engaged and to have a say in things. I think that it's really important to hear from them so that they can develop them, those skills from a, from a young age so that they know how to engage as they grow older and, you know, they're allowed to vote and um, be engaged in society and civic society. So yeah, I think it's really, there's many benefits to be had for us, for them to, uh, to listen to young people's voices. Well, you must be an inspiring teacher. That's all I can say. Um, back to Emily, as a young person, Emily, um, I'm interested to know, what are your views and ideas on youth participation? I have to say, I echo everything Priyanka just said. Um, I think as a young person, being able to go and listen to like-minded young people, or even if they don't believe the same things as me, it's as equally valuable to listen to those young people, as ultimately children and young people are the experts in their own lives. So we should be listening to them to create policy for their future. Um, I think, I'm going to be honest, before I was a UNICEF Young Ambassador, I had barely thought about participating within uh, decision-making, change-making. It was only really when I met people like my fellow young ambassadors that I was able to go beyond my small country town in Victoria. Um, so as Priyanka was saying, that civic education, it can go, it can go beyond the bounds of a community, a, a township, and children, young people participating and raising their voices just because they are calling for change does not mean they're whining or complaining because they can lead movements that it's not because of their age that, that they don't have opinions. All people have opinions, children, young people should be considered a equal part of the constituents and uh, the stakeholders in change. Yeah, absolutely. I think most of us on, on the call and, and the event tonight will agree with that. Uh, Thenu, can I ask you, how do you think education, both traditional and non-traditional, um, provides autonomy and agency for young people, especially girls, to unlock the future that they want to see? Yeah, for sure. I just want to start off by echoing everything that Emily said. I think the number one way that we can tackle the biggest issues of our time, whether it be 
poverty, climate change, corruption, gender inequality is by empowering young people and giving them the tools to fully participate in our society. Youth participation doesn't only give young people a voice in the decision making rooms, it actually benefits everyone. If we can stop misinformation, if we can give young people critical thinking skills to take through their entire lives, we're going to be facing a drastically different and positive future from what we've seen in previous generations. So just really wanted to echo what Emily said there. Um, in terms of traditional and non-traditional education pathways, I think everyone on this call would understand that education is really the key to giving people that out um, from the cycle of poverty or other injustices that they face in their lifetimes. At Oak Tree, we've had a little bit of a transition recently from traditional education models to non-traditional education models. For example, um, we are focusing more on civic participation, leadership workshops, and empowering young people to think critically rather than traditional modes of math, science, and you know English, all of that. And I think they work really hand in hand in order for young people to continue to, to think critically about the issues that they face in their communities. Mm -hmm. um, one example that I can give you is a partner organization that we work in Cambodia with. Um, they're called Kyla, and their secretariat is actually run by youth volunteers from local universities, and they help deliver services to target high schools in their areas and their communities. And so these young people go around to different schools and provide work workshops on budgeting, personal finances, communication, public speaking. Um, problem solving analysis and even even things like debating skills and this is really starting to get people to think differently about what education really needs to be and actually places the onus back on locals and local people to imagine what they want in their communities rather than being a foreign approach to education so in that way it actually decolonizes aid and um, uh, development as well so those are some ways that we at oak tree are trying a different approach to education that has been getting some really great results mm, so well put um and can i come back to you how do you see global education in particular impacting women's rights yeah. um, I guess Sorry, Nicole, was that to me or? No, sorry, that was to Anne. Sorry, go ahead, Anne. Uh, no problem. Uh, yes, no problem. Like I said before, I believe that education is a fundamental human right. And um, of course, an essential part of women's rights. And to achieve um, gender equality, we need to deliver on three interlinked areas for guns, education, health, and safety, and in education, this means giving girls and boys equal opportunity to learn mm -hmm. and through education. When we have a global education, the basic education right of girls and women will be protected and is a pathway towards gender equality because well-educated girls and women can lead an independent life, can have a job, can earn a living, and make decisions about their lives and their bodies. In fact, girls who receive an education are less likely to marry young um, and more likely to live healthy and productive lives. They earn higher incomes, build better futures for themselves and their families. And uh, of course, they can take on leadership roles on local and even national levels and increase women's representation in different uh, fields. Um, they can later act as um, defenders and protectors for women's rights. And actually the reason I'm proud to advocate for UP is that it uses the power of partnership to get the political and financial support to get girls in school. Twice as many girls are now on the path towards gender equality in VP partner country now. Yeah, that, that, there's so many um, valid points there. Um, can we just talk about addressing barriers and solutions? If I can address the next uh, couple of questions to Alex and Thanu. Um, what do you think the current barriers are to education globally? I'll jump in here. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think um, we just heard from Anne, one of the, the biggest um, structural barriers that we see is, um, is gender inequity and inequality and um, patriarchal structures that are really, really stubborn. You know, we, we take two steps forward and sometimes it feels like we're 
taking steps back. And I think we see that the, the world over. Um, but but um, I think the barriers are, we're also seeing that they are surmountable. We're seeing a lot of change um, barriers. I mean, inequities around um, other areas of identity, race, religion, um, sexuality. We're, we're seeing so much um, movement advocacy from the ground up against those bigger structural barriers. There are the barriers that we've talked about already tonight, again, that are, um, you know, require more technical solutions around um, natural disasters. Um, and so, yeah, we, we do we do whole courses and units on, on these barriers. We're all well versed, unfortunately, too well versed in them. But um, I definitely think that we've seen change over the, the, the global social policies that we've had in recent generations, education for all, Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, of course, it's the work of the GTE, um, and how we've learned from each prior um, set of approaches, you know, the, the pitfalls, the shortcomings, um, and, and have a much more in, an informed um, sense of what those barriers entail. And, and at the core of everything is partnerships between people rather than treating issue, issues in silos. We have people coming together and recognizing that, that actually these are complex issues that um, you know, require many voices at multiple levels. So yeah, I'll mm. hand over to you, Jenny. Brilliant. I think Alex put it perfectly. I don't have too much more to add to that, but I think specifically um, in the COVID-19 context, the infrastructure and resources available to people are probably the key short-term thing that we need to address and overcome. Like I mentioned at the start, um, a lot of my cousins, friends are also unable to access um, access education at the moment because of the lack of internet or capacity within the schools at the moment. So I think the first thing we need to address is how we can um, make it a little bit more equitable with actual access to education. And then from there, look at the systemic issues we need to address that Alex has so greatly mentioned. Yeah, great. Um, what do you, Alex and Thanu, think needs to happen to improve global education? I, I think, again, um, the partnerships that this tonight is an example um, of, of bringing people together, the work of the GP, the work of Oak Tree, the work of um, Teach for Australia um, and around the world, um, you know, teachers, educators, I mean, and, and I, I think, at, at, as I said, multiple scales of activity, it's possible for us all to, to contribute in, in different ways. Um, I, I guess something of I heard this morning in the news from the, the World Health Organization, head of the World Health Organization sort of was despairing about the, um, the vaccine situation. It's, it's not, you know, the, the positive side of human nature, but if we can um, turn away from often the, the greed or in, and power that, that is there in our world and, and um, harness empathy, harness, you know, kind of those common experiences um, that too many people are having, um, and recognize recognize our common humanity. Um, you know, uh, yeah, we can go from from our own individual scale right up through to uh, the the policy and and leadership level. And we need to we can we can all harness different aspects of that. I think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and just a, a final question to all panelists. Um, whoever wants to respond, why do you believe um, that Australians need to be contributing to improving education globally? Why, why, why Australia? Why do we need to be involved? I think there are the obvious moral arguments that we can make um, about not leaving anyone behind in this. I think COVID-19 has highlighted more than anything that we are actually all in this together, that things that affect people um, in our region more broadly, whether it be in Asia Pacific or even around the world can so easily affect us here in Australia as well. And um, it's 
which is, for lack of a better term, just the right thing to do for our fellow humans. But if we want to get a little bit more pragmatic about it as well, um, increasing education outcomes has been proven time and time again to create more stability within nations, within communities, and that severely increases the um, stability of regions more broadly. So I think one of the key concerns for Australia in the post-COVID world is our own national security. And I would actually argue that ensuring that global education is a priority actually increases our national security and um, puts Australia in a place where we are in a safer region as well. So mm -hmm. if moral, if we put aside moral arguments, it actually affects everyone here in Australia and it's worth the investment in, in my eyes. Yeah, great. Um, I've just had a, a question that's come from um, uh, Dilly Dutel. Uh, can you share your experience of what would be the enabling environment to the girls to continue the education in the countryside? So can you share your experience of what would be the enabling environment um, for girls to continue their education in the countryside? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Okay, well, um, well oh, thanks. Oh, sorry. Oh, just very quickly. Yeah, pre oh, pre sorry. No, pre go ahead, Alex. You go ahead, Alex. <laughs> Uh, I'll very briefly, I mean, there, I, it's, I, I guess it's a long pause partly because there are, you know, so many different kinds of countrysides. It's very, it's, I, for me, it's kind of, ah, the complexity, that's yeah. the academic thing. <laughs> um, well, we'll all we'll, we'll see that. But um, I think that, you know, there are a, a number of great examples. What came to mind was ActionAid's um, work with um, women in rural communities and um, leading groups. Um, to, to form literacy circles. And I think you know, there, there are a range of, um, of different examples. Again, a lot of NGO grassroots work in, in different contexts, but I, I think it really the attention to context and what needs exploring what, what young people's and uh, community needs are within that particular context is a start to see what a relevant education of good quality would look like for, for that place. Um, and then support from, again, partners who are committed to listening to those voices. Um, sorry, a bit garbled. No, that was, that was good. Priyanka, did you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I was just going to say that um, I think, you know, speaking to my colleagues who teach in um, regional schools, I think something that can be a barrier for students or girls in regional schools is, um, you know, if they're far away from where universities are, um, it's a a big barrier for them to have to move out of home and uh, far away from their families to continue their education. And I think that, you know, from the experience we've had in through COVID-19, like now we're learning that we can do um, a lot of education remotely. And I think that, you know, obviously it's not, it's a, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of challenges to that, but I also think that's something that we could potentially look at leveraging to sort of bring the uh, potential of tertiary education closer to home if you are living far away from where a lot of universities tend to be located. Yeah, great. Just one quick question um, before we go to Senator Deborah O'Neill. Um, from the panellists, how important is it for Australia to fund global education? Um, I'll, I'll say it's hugely important. I mean, I know that we are, you know, everywhere is facing um, big challenges financially in the world with, with COVID-19 certainly, but um, Australia um, has an opportunity to, to provide leadership in that area where it might not be, we might not be in other areas. And this, you know, like uh, Tenu said, it's the right thing to do morally, ethically, but um, financially it's, it's an investment. It's, there's an instrumentalist um, gain in perspective as well. And um, we are comparatively um, in, a, in a, a very strong financial position in many ways. Um, and it, yeah, so I would say it's, it's, it's hugely important. Yeah, great. Okay, so following um, this discussion, I just want to thank all the panellists um, and, and your fantastic answers. It's been deeply appreciated today. So um, we've had a fabulous panel and um, you've got a fantastic amount of experience in action and passion, so thank you. Um, so now I would like to introduce and hear from Senator Deborah O'Neill. So um, I would um, like to ask a question um, to Senator O'Neill. Can you tell us the role that education has played in your own life, Senator O'Neill? 
Well, um, look, thank you very much for the question, Nicole, and for your excellent facilitation of this evening's discussion. I'm, I'm coming to you from the central coast of New South Wales, otherwise known as the land of the dark and young and the Gurungai people, um, in lockdown. And uh, I have to say it's wonderful to hear the thought leadership that's been advanced in the course of this evening by Emily and Arne and Thanu and Priyanka and um, Alex uh, just, I hear a lot of people speak and a lot of people come to Parliament and they put their views, but the passion and the insight that you've brought to this evening in conversation is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and what we're doing now is actually public education. So education at every part of your life, whether it's formal or informal, traditional, non-traditional, is truly transformative. But some of the most exciting comments that I think um, I've heard this evening was the acknowledgement of the, in, the critical nature of the relationship that exists between learners um, and those who teach, which is not necessarily the teacher in the classroom. You know, we're in a, a democratic society, we're in constant interactions with one another. And I remember in my own research, um, when I was lecturing in education at the University of Newcastle, I read an article that really stuck with me about Malawi and in Malawi, they actually had a very basic education um, established at the time. A civil war was raging, but they found nonetheless that students who attended uh, at six years of basic pr primary school had a much greater disposition for dem democracy. Uh, because in the end, um, public education is a massive investment by society in the advancement of the democratic ideal and it's, underment, uh, it's fundamentally underpinned by a belief in the equal dignity of each person. And we talked this evening about the, the push points where that fundamental uh, access uh, to opportunity that would give equitable outcomes is just not the way the world is. So for me, you know, I didn't start out with all those thoughts. They came to me by education in its formal and informal way. So again, it's... Mm -hmm. It's just been wonderful from the day I begged my mother to let me go to school. I loved the learning. Fantastic. Um, uh, Senator O'Neill, we can also see that you were the Shadow Assistant Minister for Innovation and innovation and education are very linked and a former high school teacher um, with a passion for gender equality. Why do you think it's important for the government to take a leadership role in advocating for global education? Well, can I um, just acknowledge my colleagues who are on the line? I, I know that we've got um, Graham Perrett, my colleague from Queensland, and Tony Zapier from South Australia. And great to see that there's a, a few men who are joining this conversation. Yes, and really you know, it, it. it's, it's kind of interesting to think that, you know, in the descriptors we've had, that um, in certain parts of the world, happily it's not the case so much in Australia, but in other parts of the world, uh, girls aren't accessing education. Uh, yet here we have thought leadership from women who are, really dominating the education space and perhaps that's something we need to think about bringing you know men more men's voices back into the conversation as well here in Australia um, to to have that sense of role modeling of the power and the value of education in the public place so I want to acknowledge those great colleagues of mine and also um, acknowledge that Graham's a teacher was a teacher as well before he came to parliament um, why should Australia commit to global action on education was that the core of your question yeah that's right why why should um the government take a leadership role in advocating for global education well australia actually is uh, according to the imf the 12th largest economy in the world with um a gmp of two trillion dollars so given that relative wealth by comparison to others, despite our concerns to lift education and find better ways to invest in our own country. Uh, I think it's vital that we take thought leadership and practical leadership um, in an ethical way as proponents of democracy and beneficiaries of democracy, building that democratic capacity in our region uh, if, if, I, if I think back to um, the contribution from um, Thanu, I think uh, it was Thanu who was talking about the practical outcome of investment in our region in terms of national security. Uh, that, that is a reality that we are confronting. And I think the government are uh, in a, a, a change in foreign policy where they've shifted to uh, a step up in the Pacific, as they've called it, have actually really begun to rethink 
the nature of investment in our region. So we have a responsibility to bring about good educational outcomes for the health, the well-being, and the general stability of the region in which we live, which is why I'm so delighted to have this Oceania role for the first, um, the inaugural board of the International Parliamentarians Network for Education. And uh, that's, that's a brand new thing. There are now 30 signatories um, with members of all parties, including independents in the federal parliament signed on, uh, and also uh, 40. So those 30 plus another 10 signed uh, a letter, an open letter to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, the Senator, uh, right, uh, Senator Maurice Payne, and we were encouraging her to make a commitment on Australia's behalf to the Global Partnership for Education. Fantastic. Can I just um, ask, we're, we're all about action tonight, so we're going to do a little action in a minute, so please stay on the line right to, to the end because um, um, it'll be worth your while. Um, Senator O'Neill, I just want to ask you, it can sometimes be intimidating to meet with parliamentarians um, and we're wanting to encourage people to act. So why should people be inspired to go to their politicians to take action on important issues like global education? Why should they feel confident about doing so? Because uh, every citizen is just like my kids. <laughs> they have conversations with me. We're humans. We're mums. We're dads. We're brothers, sisters, fathers, you know, aunts, uncles, grandparents. We're the Australian citizens that you are. We're just at a particular point in that circulating model of power where we have this leadership role in a way that's signified by our role in the parliament. But leadership doesn't only happen in Parliament. It happens every single day in every interaction. Uh, by the choices that you make, you lead people or sometimes you walk away and you leave people behind. So um, the insight, as I commenced with my, in acknowledging my remarks earlier, the insight that's here and present in the conversation this evening um, more than adequately qualifies every single one of you and millions and millions of others to actually move to active citizenship. And it is of deep concern to me that we are really doing very, very badly in international assessments around civics and citizenship. citizenship. And Australians really haven't confronted the fact that if we don't teach people about mm -hmm. citizenship, not just this is the shape of the parliament, this is how many people go in and this is the colour of the thing and the bells ring and it's great to know that. But that doesn't help you make your community a better place to live. It doesn't help you advocate, you know, for the very bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that people, people need housing. How do you learn? How do you go to school and get the benefit of education if there's no roof over your head, if you're sleeping in a car two streets away from Woi Woi Primary School with your mother who's fleeing domestic violence and there's nowhere for you to go and there's nowhere for you to be clean and there's no way for you to have food prepared. So we need champions and advocates in every community to join political parties. You know, I'm in the Labor Party. I'm always going to say that's the best one. Come and join our party. But people who have a passion for politics, for their community, should become active in, in, in political parties. We need that diversity. It's a great asset to us. And I strongly encourage people to think about coming, being part of parties, putting your ideas forward, being part of a local community group to create activism and change and improvement for many where you live. We can it's all do it. Path to purpose, isn't it, really, for, for a lot of us. Um, I've got a couple more questions that have come from um, just people on the at the event tonight. Um, how do you, Senator O'Neill, imagine women's lives will be changed by having improved access to education across the globe? Oh, in every possible way. Uh, we, we know that if we can invest in women's education or young women's education in the way that Arne was speaking, we help them set their sights higher. I mean, I know in the US, for example, just the, the funding for education, which is very patchy depending on where you are in the country, um, has often come from health investment dollars. Because we know that if you actually help people learn to read, it's amazing what a difference that makes when you need to get information out or when people are interacting with medicines and directions. God knows right now, if 
Australia had invested in the 80s and 90s, noughties and 10s of this, of this period of time as they did in the 70s in terms of public education and access for multicultural literacy about other cultures, about other religions, and also about learning English, we wouldn't be facing the um, communication barriers that are now embedded across multiple generations in Australia. So, you know, we, we need to educate women because by doing so, that changes the dynamics of every family, of, of every uh, opportunity for literacy, uh, and it's the way to relieve poverty because constant learning and constant capacity to keep being uh, re-educated by others and educating yourself is the only way to actually survive and thrive in a permanently changing world. Very inspiring, uh, Senator O'Neill. Just one more question. You've got a lot of questions coming. Uh, there's a lot of interest in what you say and, and we're just really grateful for all the parliamentarians um, on, on, in the event tonight too. Um, so uh, the question from Dilly is, um, sorry, I'm just going up, is um, it would be great to hear you elaborate more on education and job creation and how that the two align um, to, you know, support women's empowerment. Education and job creation and women yes. in particular? Yes. Okay. How the, how the two align to Look, support. I think there's so much exclusion. Um, and I'll just talk about, you know, in our particular cultural moment here, there's so much exclusion um, that women do of themselves from opportunities um, because of the way we think about education and the way we've been schooled. Um, one of the things I say to young women is there are so many more opportunities out there than you think that you have. Um, believe that young men who are the same age as you, who are educated in the same classrooms as you, will look at the world in Australia right now and see opportunities and seize opportunities and show up at an interview and say, you're so lucky I've shown up. And they will take those opportunities. And we still have um, the creation of a sense amongst too many young women about making sure that you have the qualification and you can tick all of the boxes before you go into the job. Now, in the field of innovation, I've spoken with some of the, you know, the leading employees in the country, including Atlassian, about what they do to try and overcome the gender bias that's embedded. And there are wonderful um, software instruments now that people are running over ads to try and change the way they're structured because they found these, you know, checklist ads were actually drawing many more young men into ticking them off. So yeah. education and qualification are not necessarily meeting the reality of rapidly changing workplaces. And the gap between universities now and new thought leaders and innovative businesses that are coming through it's starting to grow. Uh, and I fear that the erosion of investment in public education, particularly in the higher education sector, has now led to, um, perhaps because of COVID, an enormous gap between what universities can do to respond to a rapidly changing world. Uh, and uh, education in place, education in work, less formalised, less qualify, qualifying and less... Um, symbolically acknowledged uh, is actually becoming a currency and I think we need to get a whole lot more girls on board with that and they can do they'll do that all better if they can get some coding lessons. In partner in women and men in partnership as well someone was just commenting is, is so important. A hundred percent. Yeah very very important we do we do it together don't we. Um, I do have one. Well sometimes we do. We, we, we want to do it together, but um, let me tell you, there are still incredible structural boundaries. So women continue this narrative of generosity towards we want to do it together. Uh, we are more qualified than most men. That The statistics show that the reality in terms of pay gaps the other way around um, and the, the operation of power is the other way around. So, um, you know, we actually have to get the guys to let loose a little bit to, of some of those to allow women to go forward. So, yes, the goal should be parity because it's roughly 50-50, but it's not there. And 
I think we need to be bolder in claiming our spaces still. We're not there. And uh, you can only, you only have to look at the parliament to see, you know, the horror of stories there and the exploitation that we've heard of to know that it's, it's not all well in the world yet. Well, it's a great conversation and, and, and um, Senator O'Neill, thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, I just wanted to end, um, we might come back to one question for the panel if we have time, um, but I want to make sure that we take our action tonight. So we're, um, every change starts with a powerful act. So today we're finishing the call with a photo action. Um, if you feel comfortable, please turn on your video and raise your hand or both hands and um, Bruna and her team will take a photograph. So I'm raising both hands. So anyone who wants to raise their hand um, will be taking a photo for social media and we'll share the photo and call on our leaders to fund global education. So if I can just count you down. Um, one, two, three. Okay, we can't hear the click, but I'm assuming the click's been done. Thank you very much. Paul, sorry, can we do it again, please? Yep, yeah, sure. And Absolutely. Bruno, if you can unshare your screen. Yep, yeah. okay. I'll just count down. One, two, three. Okay, we could even do a video one with lots of waving fingers. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I love a I love a photo action. Um, so as Nicole, I can I can I just make one final point? At the yes. end of this month, on on the 28th and 29th of July in London, the Global Partnership for Education mm -hmm. um, gathering is occurring for the replenishment, and we will know on that date exactly what Australia's commitment will be for the next five year sequence. Um, the goal's five billion internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, the US haven't formalised their commitment yet. A, a lot of countries have, lots of countries under pressure with their own economies. But mm -hmm. I'm really hoping that Senator Maurice Payne has heard the voice of the parliamentarians from all those parties and that Australia will, you know, do its bit as the 12th largest economy in the world and make a good commitment. And, and that will transform lives. So hopefully it's somewhere close to the 70 to $90 million per annum that has been requested by the GPE. So watch this space. And if you want to encourage um, Minister Payne, I would encourage you to do so. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, well, I hope you've been a little inspired to act tonight. So um, if you feel, so, feel to do so, please contact your local member to share your passion for improving global education outcomes. Um, there's a media toolkit which you should definitely look up via the results website and we'll also put that on the chat box now um, which has got some really good tips and actions because we do want to be people of action. Um, also share on social media and, um, and share the, spread the word around the importance of global education. But thank you so much everyone for your time tonight. Um, I think we're okay for time. We're just right on 8.30. Um, we really appreciate the conversation. We really appreciate you being so passionate about this issue. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you everyone. Right, everyone. Thank you. All the organizers. Thank you.